morning and welcome to Old Lake God Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord. I do have a few announcements, some of which I just received. Uh, the, by the way, the friendship books are back. If you could, just fill them out. Uh, if they're not collected every week, just keep filling them out. We'll be able to collect them in time. Uh, we have a bunch of softball games coming up. Uh, tomorrow night at 8.45, Field 2, we take on Trinity. And on Tuesday, we have two games. One at 7.30 against Peckway Baptist, and one at 8.45 against Weaverland 1. Both of the games on Tuesday are Field 1. Uh, the game on Monday is Field 2. Next week, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, at both services, and for those people at home, we will certainly incorporate uh, your presence as we participate in that great feast. So uh, do mentally, spiritually, prayerfully come prepared for communion next week. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none, then let us begin our worship together. <laughs> Let us be jubilant with joy. 
And now let us sing hymn 643. Now thank thee, O our God. Let us pray. I am God, you bless us, and you wish us to be glad. But often our hurts and our fears turn us from joy. Doubting life, doubting you, keeps us from being joyous. Help us, Lord. Help us to believe in the light of joy, even in the presence of darkness. Make our hearts glad. Amen. Jesus, even though he knew it would hasten his passion, turned water to wine to save a party, to allow the people some joy in a hard life. And the Lord still wishes his people joy past all the wrong we do, all the hurt we know. This is why I can say to you this day, in Jesus' name, that we are forgiven. Leave a space in your life to be glad. And share a smile. Rejoice. Amen. <laughs>
Let us not come before the Lord with the joys and concerns that are on our hearts this morning. Do any have any joys or concerns that you'd care to lift up at this time? All right, I have a few. Our prayer people this week, our prayer person last week was Alan Barnes. We're glad you're back safely. We hope you had a great time up in the north. We hope it was cooler than it was here. Our prayer people this week are Kirk and Deb Bean, um, and they told me to share with you. I had either forgotten this or didn't know this. Both had, both had COVID-19, and both got through it, not easily. And their health now is good. Uh, they have an RV and they're doing some camping locally. They're going to be making trips to Chicago and Virginia and Pennsylvania over the next several months. And they ask for prayers for Sister Annie, who has a brain disorder. We also want to lift up the Farr family. Uh, they're going to be at the second service, and if you care to meet them and talk with them and catch up with them, you can chat with them after that service. Jamie took a sabbatical in June, and the family traveled to a variety of national parks and other beautiful spots in this country. Uh, they're going, the family is going through a period of discernment as J Jamie tries to figure out what will be the next chapter in his ministry. And Anita has healed from her the shingles that she got about 90%, but she still has a little ways to go, so we ask that you pray for that family. I'd like to make a special joy, mention a special joy, uh, for everybody who made Carl Plumchuk's service happen. This is a highly unusual service in the sense that it took place at this point in the pandemic. We had to adjust all kinds of regulations and restrictions. We had to change over the service yesterday and then change it over today. The luncheon had to be packaged individually. And there were people, Carol Burkheimer, Esther Fisher, Dave Burkheimer, Danielle Short, Ed Margarine, and Diane, who did absolutely wonderful work to bring this together and to make it happen under often extremely difficult circumstances. So they are a joy, and I wanted to lift them up. On the concern front, obviously you all know that they have ceased searching for uh, survivors in Surfside, Florida, and the death count just keeps increasing. It's obviously going to be over a hundred, probably well over a hundred, so we want to pray for all those folks. You know, we live in a country that's got all kinds of troubles, but we don't know at the beginning of what it's like to live in a country with troubles. And we should remember the people of Haiti, who right now are in a society that is disintegrating before their eyes, um, an extremely impoverished country, and now being divided by all kinds of political discord. On a personal note, I'm going to lift up uh, some of you think it's crazy, but Emily and I don't. Our little dog, Claire, has not been well for about a month. Uh, she's had something wrong with her left leg. We discovered last week that she had this large, bleeding sore on her paw, and that may be the cause, but uh, she's not on antibiotics, and she may have surgery this Thursday, so it's an anxious time for us and for Claire, so we'd ask that you pray she is okay. Are there any other joys or concerns? Seeing none, let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, you are always delighted in your creation, in your creatures. Even though they do mortal things, you rejoice when we thrive, when we love, when we grow into the creatures you created us to be. It must puzzle you when too often we forget how to rejoice, when we miss moments of blessing, times to be glad. Help us to learn how to express our gratefulness in joy. 
This day we especially rejoice in Kirk, in Ben, in Fars, all who made Carl's service happen, and for all others whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. Loving God, the other side of joy is sorrow. And you grieve with us, you grieve for us. When we choose another way in the way of life, you will for us. When we fill with anger and resentment and fear, when we are sick in all the mortal ways to be sick, you sorrow. Come, Lord, heal us in the way you know we need to be healed. Raise us to life. Lead us back into the light. And in particular, we ask that you be with all who have been lost and all who are mourning in Surfside, Florida, that you be with the people of Haiti, that you help heal Claire, and that you be with all others when we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. And now hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us sing hymn 365, God reigns, let earth rejoice. Samuel, chapter 6, 
beginning with verses 1 through 5 and then continuing with the second half of verse 12. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baleo Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherub. He carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Adamibah, which was on the hill, Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, who were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahiah went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Abinadon to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fat man. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David, with all the house of Israel, brought up the ark of the Lord, was shouting with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. We hear a lot that this is a Christian country. Okay, but I think it's worth then asking, which Christianity? You know, if you think back to where this country began, if you think back to the early days, say, of the Puritans, think about the nature of their faith, the nature of their worship. At least from what we understand, it was fairly gray and fairly somber and fairly solemn. I don't think I have ever read in any of the sources I have consulted that they had praise bands. So I often wonder, what would the grim, sober Puritans have thought of our reading today? David has become king. He has captured Jerusalem. These are great events, long time in coming. And now he's bringing the ark of the Lord to Jerusalem. And this is a central, this is a key event. Because Jerusalem, which is central to both Judah and Israel, these different conglomerations of tribes are now coming together with one political capital, capital and one religious center. The text tells us that the ark was brought with 30,000 chosen men. Well, 30,000 chosen men indicates this was probably a military escort. But look at what happens. You know, if you knew that some kind of military band, or military procession was going to follow somebody or something into a big celebration, what would you expect? And yet here, there is no show of arms, there are no long speeches, there's no bombast or fanfare. Instead, there's just unrestrained joy All those people, all those soldiers are dancing with all their might. 
They're shouting. And there's songs. There's all kinds of instruments. Lives, harps, tambourines, cast nets, cymbals, trumpets. And, and what's significant, so often in our human celebrations, the person at the center of the celebration sits back and kind of looks over the people. And, this is the way it should be. This is what I want. You know, this is great. Not in this case. David, David himself, the king, is dancing with all his might. And he's wearing only a priestly apron. He's stripped down to the basics. And he's just abandoning himself to joy before God. So yes, this passage is about great joy. And yet, it involves human beings. And wherever there are human beings, there will always be a killjoy. And in this case, it's Michal. David's wife, who we are told despises him. She sees him leaping, dancing. And she later says, just after our reading, he's dishonored. He's dishonored what it means to be a king. Why, well, he's uncovered, he's nearly naked, right in front of servants' maids. Now remember, she's Saul's daughter. And she has a very different kind of kingship. Saul had more of that pomp and circumstance, look at me kind of leadership. You see, the thing she has, as so often we have, misplaced priorities. Where we put human pride in place first. And loving God, second. Human blindness, human blindness involves making human greatness, I very definitely say with quotes, the focus. Pomp, grimness, taking oneself too seriously is believed too often by us to be more important than joy. Joy in the presence of the source of joy. So, what is the character of faith? Is it one of judgment? Judgment of others? Is the character of faith all about self-righteousness? In resentment of those different, with different beliefs, who look or act differently? Sometimes, yes, that's the character of faith. Let me tell you the story of a woman named Deborah. She grew up in a home. Family thought they were very religious. They didn't, the parents didn't, allow any music other than gospel. No country, no classical, much less rock. The girls were not allowed to wear shorts. And before every meal, there was a long and solemn grace. And if any of the children dared to smile, they were sent to their rooms without dinner. At bedtime, their father gathered them together, read scripture, had long prayers, and spoke about how great God was and how rotten they were the children. And then Sunday they went to church where there were long, solemn services. Overall, in that version of faith, it was a very simple formula, no joy was allowed. David, after our reading, later defended himself with Michal. He says, that what he did was before the Lord, not, not those servants' maids. And he goes on to say that he'd be willing to be even more contemptible, more abased in his own eyes, and surely in hers. You see, as when he mourned for his enemy, Saul, and his friend John, David has the 
right perspective. He's got the perspective right. He's not going to, like McCall, forget God. Even at this great moment in his life. Now, in this moment of triumph, he is humble. And he remembers the Lord. It is the Lord who graces. And in the presence of grace, God, he knows that the proper response is joy. Think about it this way. Think of somebody really serious and somber and grim all the time. And absolutely certain that they're right. They're uh, sure you acknowledge it. What does grimness bring? What does all too seriousness bring? And then think about what joy brings. Before Mikah goes on a bit, just after our reading, David makes offerings. He blesses all the people. He brings food to everyone, men and women. You see, joy spreads grace. Grace multiplies when people are joyous. And grimness, grimness chokes grace of life. The woman I told you about, Deborah, well, she grew up and she went to college. And there she discovered a different kind of faith. She found ministers who didn't take themselves too seriously were fairly often self-effacing. And there was music. Guitars, flutes, drums. It was almost like folk music. And yet it still had a message that was religious. When she graduated from college, she taught at a Catholic elementary school, which just absolutely horrified her parents. And she was sure, Deborah was at first, that she's not going to adopt any of those sinful Catholic ways. As a matter of fact, she might even save some of those papists. But you know what? She again found joy in worship. She found joy in just being. And so she ended up taking guitar lessons from Chapman. And she discovered again, maybe for the first time, a gospel that was good news. A gospel that spoke of Christ's love and that there was a place for joy. And that even, maybe, God might have a sense of humor. You don't know if you've ever thought about that. Look at some of the animals that exist in the world. I think God has a sense of humor. <laughs> and she discovered, Deborah did, that, you know, church was no longer a chore. It wasn't something she had to do. Rather, she looked forward to it. She wanted to lead a Christ-like life that had a place in which to rejoice. David knew we all have a choice. Faith can be severe and it can be resentful. Or maybe sometimes the best way to worship God is to rejoice. He grieved David that he knew pain. His life wasn't always easy. It wasn't like he was always dancing and leaping. He prayed for mercy from the Lord, but still he left a place for joy. So what will it be for us? To resent or rejoice? What will be our faith? Amen. Now, in body or spirit, let us rise and affirm our faith with the saying of the Apostles' Creed is printed in bold. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing, and where you are, share the peace of Christ, inflected with joy. Smile! And if you can, for just a moment more, remain standing. Thank you for your continued gener generosity and your offering. As always, you can leave your offering, you can choose in the plate on your way out to the left, uh, or you can continue to send it in as you have been. And let us pray over that offering. Dear God, you give freely. That is grace. And you delight in a joyous giver. Receive these our gifts that we return to you with joy and trust. May they do your work. Amen. And now, rather appropriately, let us sing hymn 611, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 